the promise of the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you, God keeps his promises. He does. Amen. I'm going to go quickly through what we covered last week, but I do want to cover it because we have several folks who were not here last week, and so this is part two in a series uh, that's probably going to be at least a part three or four, and so you'll get very quickly here the first part of it. Talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit, there is no action that has ever taken place anywhere in God's universe without the initiating and empowering work of His Holy Spirit. We're just going to run through these from last week. The importance of the Holy Spirit's activities from Genesis chapter 1, first book in the Bible, to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, to the closing chapters, you see the Holy Spirit actively working within that. In fact, he's so active that most theologians refer to the period we're in as not the church age, because what's important in it is not just the church, but it's the age of the Holy Spirit. He is dominant within his body, the church. He is living within the church, and he is living out of the church to bring life to others. Isn't that awesome? You not only have life in you, but God says, Tag, you're it. Bring life to other people. You know, so grateful for those who are here this morning. The Holy Spirit is in work at you in you when you receive Christ. So this is the age of the Holy Spirit. He oversees and superintends everything done in this period. Here's we see the promise, what she had it all by herself and didn't need you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've been kicked out of better places than that, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in Joel, the minor prophet in the Old Testament, the book of Joel, chapter 2, God gave the Old Testament uh, folks the promise of his spirit, not just to the Jews, but to everyone. And then a thousand years went by and nothing. You waiting on a promise from God? <laughs> My devotion this morning, one of several that I go through, was about the fact that God is teaching us to wait. How many of you just love waiting? Mm, uh, not a one of us love waiting. But you know what I read this morning in that devotional? It said that waiting is a blessing from God. It's a blessing from God because we learn to look to Him for that which we need. If God gave you everything you wanted the minute you wanted it, you'd run off and say, thank you, Jesus, and be gone. He knows you're going to sit there in his lap. I, I do this with God, eyeball to eyeball. Come on, God. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. He says, I know the right time. I know the right time. Any time before then, not the right time. Any time after that, too late. God has the perfect timing to answer the prayers. And so here's a thousand years later, and all of a sudden, the promise, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people, comes to pass in Acts chapter 2. Really, even in the book of John, Easter Sunday evening. John 14, chapter, uh, verse 16, Jesus appears before the disciples. He tells them, I'm going, I'm going back to heaven to be with the Father. And they don't understand what he's talking about. And Thomas and Peter have a discussion about, Lord, we don't know what, what way are you going? And uh, Jesus is so patient with us. He looks at the disciples and he says, have I been with you so long? And you don't know that I am the way? I'm the way. You're going through a rough time? He's the way. He's the way. Don't look to people, look to Jesus. Amen? He is the way. And so he says to his disciples in the midst of this conversation, I'm going away. But I will ask my Father. Now, how many of you think that the Father is probably going to do what Jesus, his son, asks him to do? Yeah. He says, I will ask my Father, and he, the Father, will give you 
another comforter just like the first. That's what another means in the Greek, just like the first. He says, I'm going to send you, translation, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and his character will be just like mine. You've seen me love you, walk with you, talk with you, encourage you, cry with you, convict you, you know, sin, righteousness, and judgment. You've seen me do those things. He said, the Holy Spirit's going to do the same thing. He's another comforter just like the first. And he'll be with you for a few days or so. And you'll have a good time and then he'll go, right? No. He will be with you for how long? Forever and ever. Alleluia, alleluia. I want, I want to sing the alleluia chorus, but I can't sing, so I, I'll spare you. Uh, did you say amen to that? No. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> so he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever and ever. Now, six chapters later, the Gospel of John. It's Easter Sunday evening, Resurrection Sunday evening. Jesus has been crucified. It was awful to go through. All but one of the disciples and Mary's mother left Jesus even Peter denied him, as Jesus promised, three times. And Jesus appears in the resurrected body that the Father and the Spirit gave to him. He appears in the upper room, preached this last week, the door is locked, and he walks through the door. You say, well, who unlocked it? Nobody. He walked through the door. Through the door. In the same resurrection body, are you ready for it? I'm not telling you. Some of you aren't ready. Okay, yeah, I'll tell you. The same resurrection body you're going to have. Really? Oh, yeah. The same resurrection type of body that took Jesus from the grave, resurrected him, gave him an eternal body to go with his eternal spirit. He went, we know, down into... Hades spoke to those who were held prisoners there, Ephesians chapter 4, and then he went up to heaven twice. Actually, he went first to heaven, showed the sacrifice to the Father, then he went down to Hades, then he went back to the Father. But in the meantime, over 500 people saw him in an Easter appearance post over a number of days, over 500 of them. How many do you need to establish a thing as true in a court of law? Two. The scripture gives us 500 witnesses who saw Jesus alive. I think that's an established fact, Josh. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. And so here's Jesus. He's appeared in his resurrection body. He's gone through the locked door. He stands in the midst of the disciples who were petrified because they just saw their leader get brutally murdered, and they're afraid that the Romans and the Jews are going to do the same thing to them. And the first words out of his mouth, and I challenge you to find me any passage of Scripture where this isn't true. Any time the Old Testament or New where there's appearance, an appearance of God, it's called a theophany, theo for theos, God, and the Old Testament uh, word, or New Testament Greek, phany, P-H-A-N-Y, means an appearance of God. Any time you see God physically appear in the scriptures, what does he say? Peace be unto you. Every time an angel appears, the first words out of the angel's mouth is peace. Hey, I can get just as distraught as any of you. <laughs> and boy, do we get distraught. You're frustrated and upset and we don't understand why things are going the way they're going. And we had different plans. And God says, Peace be unto you. Remember what he said just before he left. My peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. As you believe in God the Father, even so believe in me, Jesus Christ. 
his son. Peace. I don't know what you're going through. Some of you I do. Boy, do you need the peace of Christ. You know, life can be a mess. Life can be tough. But you have the peace of Christ. Nothing, and I mean nothing, can destroy the peace of God. The Holy Spirit is with you. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We just read that he said he'd be with you always. So now he's in the upper room. He says to the disciples, after he says, peace be to you. Don't be worried. Don't be worried about the Jews. Don't be worried about the Romans. Don't be worried. Don't be worried about life. And then he says now. And they must have looked at him and said, well, why not worry? They killed you. Yeah, you're resurrected, but we're not you. And he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he speaks, and then he breathes on them. I mentioned last week the only other time in Scripture God breathed on anything was when God breathed on Adam after he had formed him from a lump of clay. And he had a body, but the body wasn't even alive. And the Scripture says that God breathed on him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He woke up, and there was Adam, alive. And by the way, you and I in Adam at that very moment. And the breath, literally it says in the Hebrew, it says the breath of lives, plural. Meaning you were in Adam when God woke him up. Ooh, Josh, I love that. And he said to them simply, what do you got to do? Receive the Holy Spirit. Just receive the Holy Spirit. Same question was asked a few days later. Peter, who was, mm -mm. Peter was not a very strong warrior for the cross when Christ died, but now he's a preacher anointed by the Holy Spirit a few days later. And as he's preaching to the very people he feared just a few days before, in multitudes, these Jews looked at him and said, well, what do we do? Okay, so we've crucified the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Savior from sin. We crucified him. What do we do now? Okay, we're guilty. And he says, repent. What did he tell them to repent of? Same thing we need to repent of. Trying to do things our way. Rebellion. Looking at the situation, trying to figure it out and saying, well, I, I can figure this out. I'm going to do things the way I got it figured out. And God says, don't do that. Ask me. Let me fill you with my spirit and I will lead you and guide you. That's what the good shepherd said, John. So let me fill you with my spirit so you will receive the gift. How much did you pay for that? Did they pay for that gift? Not a zip. Zero. Jesus paid it with his eternal life. They didn't pay anything. He said, it's a gift. Here. You can't earn it. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit because you're really good as a Christian. You simply repent and say, God, I've got rebellion written all over me. And when I try to lead out in my life, I make such a mess. So God, I repent of being me. And Lord, I surrender my life to you. You made it for a reason, for a purpose, to glorify you. Now, Lord, fill me with your spirit and let me see your life glorified within me. And so Peter says to them, by the way, this is a, the promise. Remember Joel chapter 2? thousand years before, God gave him a promise. Now he's fulfilled the promise. And he's preaching, Peter is, to them. And he said, this is the promise for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. Are you all afar off? Yeah, we're about 2,000 years from them. That's a far, that's a fur piece, isn't it? <laughs> okay. 
and all who are far off. That's you and me. And for all whom the Lord will call. If you're sitting here this morning, you've been called by the Holy Spirit. You're not here because you woke up and said, I guess I'll go to church today. You're here because the Holy Spirit led you here this morning. And so, all whom the Lord will call. Now, new material, lots of time. What's the Holy Spirit's name? I've got a name. Some of you pried out of me my first name, Laura Jean. She runs around, did run around telling everybody, hmm, his first name is Ralph. You looked at the R. Gordon and thought, that's, that's distinguished. I thought so, too. That's why I changed it from Ralph to R. Gordon. Looked more distinguished as a kid. Who cares today? You know, I am who I am. But we have a name, but we also have a title. We're going to look at the names of the Holy Spirit, just a few of them, and then we're going to look at the titles of the Holy Spirit. My name is Ralph Gordon Spiller. His name is the Holy Spirit, but here's the the original words in the Hebrew first, rock, rock, means the wind or the breath of God. What did Jesus do in the upper room? <sighs> he breathed on them the breath of God, the Spirit of God. What did God the Father breathe into Adam as that cold lump of clay laid on the ground in Genesis chapter 3. What, what did he breathe into him? Life. The breath. The wind of God. If you can do this, you can thank the Holy Spirit because he gave you life and he gave you breath. But he not only gave you life in this life, but he's given you eternal life. And we'll get to that in a second. From Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where it says God breathed on, on uh, Adam, to John chapter 20, verses, verse 22, where Jesus breathed on the church. His name is the wind and the, the breath of God. Then there's a Greek, the pneuma. The pneuma. When they first came out with tires, with air, they called them pneumatic tires because they had air in them. Uh, BB guns are sometimes referred to as pneumatic guns. They have CO2 cartridges, not BB guns, but those kinds of guns. They, they, the power comes from the air. Let me tell you, the power inside of you comes from the pneuma, from the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't know if I got what it takes to get through this life. You've got it. Because you've got the pneuma, you've got the power of God resident within you through the Spirit of God. Through the Spirit of God. And then comes the Greek word ekenos. Ekenos. It really has two meanings that are always used together. The first is that one. Now we wouldn't go around saying, you know, that one. But if somebody says, well, who is the Holy Spirit? He's that one. But it's a male pronoun so it sounds a masculine pronoun so it's really it's translated he because it's masculine so the holy spirit is a he and yet i love his comfort comfort doesn't always have to come from females most of us have known the greatest tenderness within our lives came from our mom or somebody who loved us in my family, it was the exact opposite. My dad was the tender, loving kind, and my mother was the Gestapo agent. I guess she figured she had to be because my dad just gave away the farm, you know. Uh, but he, my dad, was the tender one. I want to tell you, he, the Holy Spirit, is the tender one. And then we come to the next name. That's precious. It's my favorite name for the Holy Spirit. The parakletos, it's the Greek, the parakletos, para, meaning coming along or with, and kletos, somebody who literally wraps his arm around you and walks you through to the other side of the crisis you're in. That's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He knows you're going through a hard time. You know, he knows that. And he's given you the Holy Spirit to wrap his arms around you and carry you literally to the other side 
of that crisis. Mm. The parakletos, or the comforter. The comforter. Who's a comforter? Somebody that they just love on you. You know. I try and emulate that within my life. Don't always succeed. Sometimes I fail miserably. But I try to be like the comforter. If somebody's having a hard time, I want to be there for them. I want to wrap my arms around them. Uh, I want to just encourage them and say, you're going to get to the other side. By the way, this afternoon, I'd ask for your prayers for me as I travel, but also, uh, how many of you remember, uh, yep, <laughs> Trudy Fish. Wow, how soon we forget our friends, right? How many of you remember Trudy Fish? Uh, she led the, uh, uh, the, well, she led about five different groups that I sat on boards for her, but Shepherd's Troop is the one you're familiar with. And uh, she and her husband founded a number of ministries for disabled children and disabled adults. Uh, I sat on some of those boards. It was my privilege to do so. Trudy, who's been here many times with her uh, disabled choir, and I, you know, it's the only time I've seen you folks ball. When she'd come and minister, man, the tears would just start to flow as you see disabled folks just reaching out and praising God in genuine love. They understood it. They got it. They knew what was going on. She is in Mercy Hospital right now in the last stages of cancer. Uh, they've called in hospice, and uh, she just got a hold of the family. And Larry, her son, who's in Nashville, Tennessee, called me and said, I'm driving up. Can I meet with you, and will you come see her? So this afternoon, I'm going to go spend some time with the family uh, and with uh, Trudy. Pray for her. Pray that God takes her quickly, uh, lovingly into her arms. That's the same prayer you and I would want. She's already told the family, I can't fight anymore. I'm, I'm exhausted uh, from the fight. Pray for her. He's the comforter. This afternoon, I want to be the comforter to her. I probably won't stay long because the whole family is there and she's exhausted and, and uh, doesn't need a long-time visitor. But, uh, so pray for me and pray for Trudy this afternoon. Uh, the comforter. Then comes the titles. My name is Ralph Gordon Spiller. But I have a bunch of titles. So do you. You know, called Dad. I was called hubby, you know. Uh, pastor. Uh, you know, filled a bunch of roles. You filled a bunch of roles in your life. These are the titles, meaning this is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He is the, and every one of these in the scriptures start with the Spirit of. Every one of these passages, if you go there, it'll start with the spirit of. First one is the spirit of life. Again, if you can do this, you're alive. Who gave you that life? The Holy Spirit. We had two people this week uh, from Brockton, Portland, who died. Two of them. And we need to pray for their family. Uh, died from shoveling snow, a lot younger than I am. Uh, one of them, the spirit of life, when God says your life is over, it's over. When God speaks life to you, you're born. The days of man are numbered by God. People who we would have thought wouldn't have lasted at all last over a hundred years. We celebrated some of those. Ruth uh, hit her 100th birthday and then said, I'm done fighting, and she went home to be with the Lord within a matter of weeks. Uh, Cora, I love you. She's our next in line. She's the queen of the church here. <laughs> She'll be 100 this year, and as she doesn't look it. Uh, life. We have life as long as God gives it to us. And when he says you're done, you're done. He's the spirit of life. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. 
Luke chapter 11, verse 13. He's the spirit of holiness. We talked earlier about the fact that some days we just, we don't know if we're ever going to make it to that stage called holiness. We look at our failures, our mistakes, the things we do, the things we say, how we have the wrong attitudes at times when we should as believers have the right attitudes and we just get frustrated with ourselves. Well, maybe you don't, but I do. Any of you feel that sometimes too? Not enough patience. You think, I wish I had more patience. Uh, B's going, yeah, I know, yeah. And yet God has placed you in the situations you're in, and he knows. And he is the spirit of holiness. He's building sanctification in you, holiness in you. You will be perfect in glory. Can't wait. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. He's the spirit of grace. I had a college professor used to say to us, Folks, if you've been saved by grace, be gracious. Why is the church, and certainly not this church, but why is the church, you know, why do people who are born again sometimes get frustrated and upset with the church? It says, he is the spirit of grace. God's grace ought to ooze out of us. Yeah, I know, Gary. That's not always with me either. (laughs) Put you in a classroom with a whole bunch of kids. What do you want, right? (laughs) John 14, 17. He's the spirit of truth. We've got a bunch of people running around saying, this is truth, that's truth. And there isn't an ounce of truth in what they're saying. Usually starts out of Washington or New York or L.A. You know. God had a scripture for that in the Old Testament. He said, they will call those things that are good evil, and they will call those things that are evil good. And that's kind of where our our, uh, society is at right now. How do you know what truth is? Oh, it's so simple. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. Isn't that interesting? The Spirit of God represents the Son of God. The Son of God says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he turns around and calls his Holy Spirit the Spirit of life, the Spirit of truth. They are what? Just like one another. They are the same. Another comforter, just like the first. He is the Spirit of truth. If you want to know what the truth is about a situation... Don't go ask 14 people. You'll get 16 different opinions, right? If you want to know what truth is, ask the Holy Spirit. He will give you, there's a spiritual gift for that, the spirit of discernment so that you know truth from a lie. Believers ought to be able to look at a situation and say, that's the truth, that's a lie. Because we have the discernment or literally the spirit of truth within us. Uh, last, And there's tons more titles than that but uh, <clears throat> for the Holy Spirit. But Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2, just for the brevity of time. The spirit of knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is what? The accumulation of facts. We get a bunch of facts. And we used to think somebody's pretty smart. Boy, if they've got a lot of facts going up there. What we discovered recently in the study of of man's brain and the culture around us is very simple. The amount of knowable knowledge. Are you ready for this? The amount of knowable knowledge doubles about every 20 seconds. Can you know everything there is to know? You got Google. (laughs) Google's not always true. So what you need is the Holy Spirit who will bring you to knowledge. But having knowledge is not enough. One of the things I see regularly is college professors and college graduates who are filled with knowledge. 
no common sense. Another one of my college professors used to tell us, if you don't have knowledge, you can ask of man and he'll help you get knowledge. If you don't have wisdom, according to James 1.5, you can ask of God and he'll give you wisdom. But then he went on to say, if you don't have common sense, neither God nor man can help you. We got a bunch of college graduates, tons of knowledge, zero wisdom. Zero wisdom. He is the spirit of wisdom. He'll show you how to take the knowledge you've got and make something good and productive out of it. That's the Holy Spirit. Wow. Last one. The Holy Spirit's ministry to us. He ministers to you and me. So we're going to ordain Josh in just a couple of weeks to the ministry. It sounds so sacred and so holy, and it is, but do you know what it means? The word for minister in the Greek is the word doulos, from which we get servant. To minister to somebody just means to serve them. That's why I'm going to give you a towel, wash some feet, you know, symbolically. So what is the ministries? the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. What does he do for you? Well, he saves you, according to Titus 3, 5, and 6. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Spirit of God, he saves you. Saves you from what? He saved me from myself. That was a good deal. <laughs> saved me from sin, from Satan, from, from the ultimate results of sin and, and uh, uh, you know, Missing the mark with God, which is what sin means, saved us from that. We were bound for a Christless eternity. And the Holy Spirit brought us life and saved us from the punishments of our sins. Uh, and then he sustains us. Romans 8.26, he sustains us. When you don't know how to pray, and that's often, isn't it? You look at a situation and I don't know what to do with that. And we hear the Holy Spirit say within us, pray. And it says when you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for you to the Father with words and groanings and utterings that you can't even understand. They are strictly a language between God the Father and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is praying for you every single moment of every day. You are covered by the prayers of God. You're covered. Wherever you are, sleeping, working, you're covered by the Holy Spirit praying over you. What else does he do? He sanctifies us. That means he purifies us. Something that's sanctified. In the Old Testament, they sanctified the utensils uh, that were used in the sacrifices. They literally brought them into the temple brand new and laid hands on them and, and wiped sacrificial blood over them and said, these uh, utensils are set apart for the usage of God. The temple was set apart for the usage of God. You know what? You and I are set apart for the temple of God, for the Holy Spirit within us. We're not to be partaking of other things, things that detract spiritually from us, that take us away from God. He said, stay away from those things. Stay close to God. You are set apart unto God. He seals us. Let me ask you. How long can you keep yourself saved? Trick question. How long can you keep yourself saved? Zero. You can't. Not a millisecond of time. My salvation does not depend on how well I do at living the Christian lifestyle. My salvation depends on the grace and the mercy of God and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have ever canned? 
Okay. When you can, what do you do? You seal it. I don't know about that, what, maybe they've got better ways of doing it today, but when my mother used to seal, uh, she'd do preserves and jams and fruit and, and vegetables and all, and she'd take hot paraffin wax, melt it, and then pour the melted wax on top of the can. And it would seal that, uh, that container, and it would preserve what was in there. You know what? That's what God is doing with you. He is preserving you. He is sealing you. And then we're going to move down to the last one in closing. And uh, there's more that he does, but these are just a quick overview. I call it he supranaturalizes you. We look at our limitations. We look at the things we can't do. We look at getting older and certain things we can't do as well as we used to do. And sometimes we try, you know. And then our body says, now nah, you're, you're still getting older. <laughs> God takes that which is weak and supernaturalizes it. But something supernatural, it might be a demonic spirit or it might be, you know, whatever. God says, I don't just supernaturalize you, I supranaturalize you. What that means is the most potent power or spirit in the universe is God. He says, I indwell you. You now have victory over demonic spirits. You have victory over any human spirit that comes against you. You have victory over everything within all of life because he's given you his supranatural life. And with that, he then gives us two things. And I close with this. What better way to close? When you're born again and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, He enters into you. He gives you Galatians chapter 5, and this is a real quick overview. He gives you the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is the character of God. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, moderation or temperance, you know. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the character. And I say, God, I'm so far from that. Help me to get there. And he says, I'm working on it every day. Keep listening. Don't shut down when I'm talking to you. So the character of God, he gives us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But then after we have, and I encourage you to don't do this until after you have developed some of the character of the fruit of the Spirit. Then he gives us the gifts of the Spirit too. And the Bible, is, the New Testament, is filled with the gifts of the Spirit that are supranatural empowerments to do things that no other person can do. Those gifts are there for us to tap and to touch. I don't think we see enough of that in the church. It's funny because if you go to Africa or China or South Korea or other places, you see the, spirit, uh, the spiritual gifts of God all over the place. I think the American church relies way too much on its head. We think too much. <laughs> we try and think everything through, and God says, don't think it through. Give it to me. Let me anoint it. Release your thoughts. Josh and I have talked a lot about this. How, how are we going to build this church? You know what? The Holy Spirit will build the church. He did that in three days. 3,000 people into the church in the book of Acts. So the gifts of the Spirit are there. So you go from being a sinner to being saved to having the Holy Spirit live within you. Now you've got the character of God you're working on. And beyond that, you've got the supernatural gifts of God for your own life, for your family's life, and for the lives of those around you to minister to. What could be better? And often we go, I don't know, God, it's so hard. He says, I've given you my spirit. What do you want? You've got everything you need inside of you. Let go and let God. Amen?